are, of course, in the forearm above the elbow on the lateral aspect in the cubital or anticubital veins. It is not a good idea to put it down in the great septinous vein, although in desperate situations when you do not have a choice and you actually do not have an excess, it is not, uh, uh, not uh, that you cannot put it in the lower limb, but by and large the clip is uh, not playing. But you can understand uh, the whole idea of why we uh, need a venous section. While doing a venous section, we normally uh, it is good, uh, it is a good practice to observe it for uh, uh, for uh, being done by somebody who is in the, in the uh, who can actually do it and then assist him while he is doing it uh, and also uh, do, uh, getting assisted while doing it. It is possible to do it in a in a normally thin built individual, in an obese individual it may be a problem. Now while you are doing it, it is good to prepare the part uh, uh, to, uh, to clean it up like we discussed about other procedures. After you have cleaned up the part, you can give local anesthetic. Local anesthetic is given right generally in the area that you are going to uh, when, uh, going to use for uh, uh, exploring the vein. It is not uh, necessary to make a very big incision. If you are in the right place, you would not need a very big incision. Usually a transverse incision is placed going along the angle lines and you open up the fascia and you actually can expose the vein. It can be hooked on with an artery forceps and you can get a distal control, proximal control with a thread and you can go through the vein and actually make an opening in the vein and introduce the cannula. The cannula can be introduced in many ways and it is a good, it's a good practice uh, to actually fix it to the skin. Venous section uh, once again should not be done if the veins can be found otherwise because it is very uh, vulnerable to infections and uh, uh, I mean while doing it there is infection and when you put in a, uh, a cannula that also is vulnerable to infection. So wherever you can find a vein that is an ideal situation, but this is one situation where uh, a resident may have to do uh, a venous section uh, that is when he does not find a vein. By and large this covers up most of the surgical procedures that a resident is supposed to uh, undertake during his uh, work as a trainee and as I mentioned they could range from uh, draining an abscess also abscess should be drained by either infiltrations or by using a short GA in the ward or some debridements can be done. A word about debridement and uh, uh, the, uh, the wound toilets. It was discussed in the morning I am sure the wound management was discussed. There is, there is a difference between debrima and wound toilet. Debrima essentially in Latin means to unleash where you open up you cut off all the fascia until it bleeds, you cut off all the tissue until it bleeds and wound toilet is using any chemical to remove all the loose dead tissue. If you can remove that dead tissue that is wound toilet. Surgical toilet is a combination of both. Now it was rightly brought out that hydrogen peroxide betadine solution within the wound is no longer a recommended uh, management. The best solution for the wound which is according to the wound society of the world is normal saline. Betadine is actually damaging for the fibroblasts, for the macrophages, it is damaging for if you cannot drink it you cannot use it on any tissue that is how that is that is the proverb used. You cannot uh, use betadine on wounds anymore, it is not recommended, it does not help, it is not supposed to produce the kind of free radicals which are earlier thought to be uh, useful. Similarly the Edinburgh University solution of lime that is use all, they are not in so much of use now when it comes to cleaning the wounds. But for chemical toilet we can use certain uh, agents which actually can uh, break down the collagen and actually help in uh, like we have collagenases which comes in the with the trade name of salutyl etc where you can remove the slough. So wound debrima, wound management is another aspect that a, uh, that a trainee may have to undertake during the ward. With that I would like to just sum it up that the bottom line in uh, most of the ward procedures is that you must have seen it before you do it. There is no point getting into a misadventure of say putting in a cannula to drain out liver abscess. Again a procedure that you do in the ward, but you do it ultrasound guided, but after you have seen it with uh, or you have ensured that the patient has a normal clotting bleeding profile, you are being supervised and as was brought out in, uh, by my previous speaker, unsupervised unscrupulous work leads to poor results, bad outcome, uh, high mortality, morbidity and unfortunately it takes away from the resident also the confidence to perform the same procedure in the future. And a lot of surgeons when they stop doing certain procedures later on, it has got its basis in the past. L like most of our fears, they are intoxicating, they stay within us. So it is important to first learn it correctly so that you can do it correctly. Most procedures are fairly simple, they are done day to day basis. Thank you very much. Thank you Dr. Chintamani. I think uh, there you have brought in some innumerable surgical pearls of clinical importance. I think all my friends would do well to imbibe them in their clinical practice and as Dr. Chintamani has said, it's practice and practice 
which will ultimately take you forward. I think thank you sir for an excellent talk on the surgical procedures. Meanwhile, uh, I would request uh, uh, Dr. Ajit Sinha, he would like to speak uh, his views on surgical procedures. Uh, I thank Dr. Chintamani for a very exhaustive uh, talk on the common surgical procedures which our residents are made are doing day, day in and day out. But one of <coughs> two points I have noted, I think will add on to the what he has said. One is that while catheterization, it is important not only to lubricate the catheter, it is also <coughs> important to lubricate the urethra. So, uh, we must also uh, inject xylocaine in the urethra with the help of a syringe under pressure, so that the whole of the urethra is not only anesthetized, it is also properly uh, 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 lubricated and it helps in passing the catheter and the injury incidence goes down considerably, you know. This is the standard procedure we were following. The second step about uh, giving sutures, I think uh, the good practice of using forceps in the left hand to hold the needle will very much avoids injury or needle prick. Absolutely. In the hand. Mandatory so, to use instruments to hold needle as uh, Professor so, has mentioned. So, every resident should uh, right from the beginning uh, get into the habit of using both hand surgery, left hand and forceps and the right hand main dissecting instrument, you know. So, that that should be right at the stage 1 or level 1, it should be started practicing because it comes slowly. Unless one tries it, one will not get it. Uh, about Riles tube, another aspect I would like to add on is that it also is now very commonly used for feeding, especially in head injury patients, plus in certain gastric fistulas, nasodudinal or nasojuginal tubes are being used to bypass the fistula with very good results. That should also be kept in mind that in special situations, we have to pass in tube into the duodenum. Few points about uh, chest tube, very important. I think securing the chest tube after putting it is also <coughs> equally important because Slipping of chest tube is a catastrophe which should be avoided. So, it should be properly secured to the chest wall by suture also and by the tape also that it does not kink or it does not come out accidentally. Regarding clamping, the chest tube should be only clamped when, uh, if, uh, when we are shifting the patient. In case of a massive pneumothorax or massive air leak, chest tube should never be clamped because there is a chance of tension pneumothorax, you know. Then when to, when to use negative suction on a chest tube is also a very important point and I think when there is massive air leak, then a negative suction helps in sealing and the pleural space and blocking it. So, then a negative suction is used. Then about trachostomy and when to remove the chest tube is also an important feature. We do not normally these days wait for the air column to move as long as we get a check x-ray shows complete. Uh, uh, expansion of the lung, chest tube can be safely removed. Well, uh, thank you Dr. Ajit Sina, I think uh, and th thank you Dr. Chintamani. It has been a, ga a galaxy of surgical, uh, distinguished yeah. surgical specialist. I think Dr. Chintamani is going to add something. Yeah, I mean thanks Dr. Dr. Sina has brought out those points. I deliberately ran through a lot of them. Uh, actually, when you, whenever you are putting in a catheter, it is rightly brought out that you will have to obviously lubricate both. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I think as he was mentioning about the negative suction, in a normal situation we do not use it. That the plurivac uh, which is used is when uh, we have a, uh, we, we are not managing the fistula surgically or bronchoscopically. Uh, it, it is, it can be used there. Now coming to the movement of the column, actually the lung is ex expanded, the ch chest tube cannot, uh, the column may not move. And the two can happen simultaneously, but uh, they can also happen one after the other. The whole idea is as long as you can swear by the fact that chest is expanded, the lung is expanded, chest tube has obviously got no function. So, you should not leave it there. And uh, coming to the nasojuginal and naso uh, intestinal tubes which are used for enterocolysis and enterocolysis feeding, they would be uh, actually uh, a different uh, kind of tubes totally. They differ from um, the nasogastric tube that we use conventionally in the sense that they have uh, a steeper and they are more blood balls and they have a stiffer tip which actually helps us guide it through flu fluoroscopically mm -hmm. as was rightly brought out gastric fistula and high output fistula. But uh, I uh, fully agree there these are the points which a resident should keep in mind. Using both hands, I mean uh, it is m mandatory not to use your hand to hold the needle. Uh, both hands have to be, it is mandatory and the right way to hold the uh, forceps of course is beyond the uh, 
uh, part of this talk, but the forceps has to be held between the between the index finger and the thumb rather than the kitchen grip, which is quite uh, irrelevant. That is where you end up actually uh, making strain on your wrist. But as very correctly brought out by Professor Sina, if you start off from the beginning, uh, it, it is not impossible to learn good things. You know, it's 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 an old saying: uh, bad habits are like soft beds, easy to get in, difficult to come out. So if you learn good things early, they stay with you. It's very difficult to unwind and relearn. So that that was the whole issue, and uh, more than this, actually, it is beyond the scope of this because as you watch it, you'll watch along all your life that procedures have to pick up. Learning continues all your life. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Sinha. Thank you, Dr. Chintamani, and thank you, Dr. Ajit. I think it, you have really given us an exhaustive view of very important surgical pearls. Meanwhile, I'll just uh, end here. Uh, next uh, teleconference would be in orthopedic special. Thank you so much.